there are about 80,000 identified species of mushrooms and over a million, they figure, that has yet to be discovered or learned about. I know a lot of the edibles. I know a lot of the common mushrooms, but I'm diving in so deep now where they don't even have common names. And there's, I'm realizing how much I don't know. So for me, if I can go out and find some edibles, that's awesome. If I can go out and find something really weird and strange like slime molds, which I'm super passionate about as well, I wanna look at that and learn about it. Or if I can just find something completely new to me that I've never seen before. Oh, cup fungus. And a kind I have never in my life seen. This is freaking cool. I would call myself a mushroom enthusiast or Michaelphile. So it started probably about seven years ago when I purchased my home. My backyard butts up to some native prairie land. And so I wanted to start getting to know these plants that were in my backyard. So I bought some ID books and just kind of really went to town with that and immersed myself in everything that was back there, which then led me off of the prairie and into the woods, seeking out different plants. And then I started noticing mushrooms and I was just mesmerized by them and intrigued, and so I kind of did the same thing with them that I did with the plants. Over the years, I've just wanted to go deeper and deeper and deeper, and kind of like really down at this kind of like microscopic little world that really does exist, so beyond the mushrooms even. I call my garage my nerd lab, and so I'm out there all the time just learning to ID different mushrooms that you know I'm not familiar with, and there's a whole process to it. You, you look at stems, you look at gills, you look at caps, and doing spore prints is a part of the ID process. I'm gonna take a black and a white piece of paper and then put the cap so it sits on both. So I cut the stem off the cap, and underneath it could be gills or pores, folds or teeth, there's all different things going on under the cap of a mushroom. And so I'll set that down flat on the paper. Usually the spores will start dropping in about two hours. And so if I'm just using it for ID purposes, that's good enough. After that sat for a couple of hours, we lift them up and it's always fun to be surprised at what's underneath. I can see the color. That's what I need to look up in a book. And I realized, I'm like, this is really pretty. I should start photographing this. And so that's kind of how it all started. I, I don't think I create art, I think nature creates it and I just photograph it and share the message of nature. I just see things in nature and I wanna share that with people. Some days I don't know what I'm going to see, and I love that, I love being surprised. I could walk the same path two days in a row and it's gonna be completely different than the day before. So right here is a really beautiful specimen of chicken of the woods, which is a very good edible, and it actually does taste like chicken. And again, I'm just using the common name I do know the scientific name, but I would butcher it if I tried to pronounce it. The underside has pores, and it's a really beautiful yellow. And then if you see up on top, it's this really beautiful kind of tangerine orange color. So this is a beautiful, young specimen, and I'm just gonna slice it open, and you'll see why it gets its common name kind of looks like chicken a little bit texturally. And then especially when you do fry it up, you'll wonder if you're having a mushroom or chicken.
One thing I always tell people now that I've learned, you can touch any mushroom you want. You encounter any mushroom in the woods, go ahead, touch it, smell it. You don't need to fear that mushroom. Only if you plan on ingesting it and you don't know what it is, then yeah, be a little scared of that. But mushrooms are not here to hurt us. They're here to help us. Yes, we can eat some of them, but largely they're there to decompose wood. Without mushrooms, we would have woods that would ultimately choke on themselves. We need the mycelial network and that fungus to connect certain plants to trees. And so everything underground is actually all connected. For a long time, I would just post pictures, you know, things I thought were kind of interesting, my finds, that sort of thing. And people really started to like message me and resonate sort of with whatever I was putting out there, which kind of surprised me. And so where I work at Minnesota West, they had asked me if I would do a half hour talk about mushrooms. And so I started doing that and I realized it was really interesting and fun and to hear their questions. Uh, and so it just kind of spawned from that. And so different community organizations would ask me to come and talk mushrooms. And usually I will have, you know, mushrooms there for people to eat as well. And a lot of times it's their first experience with anything straight from the wild. People don't need to eat the mushrooms, they're simply there for them to try. If they do, they get to, you know, sample the mushrooms, sample a certain dish that I prepare them in, and then ask me their questions and I'll give them the information that I have or things that I found that I think are pretty awesome. I always start by telling people what a mushroom actually is. Benjamin, do you know? It's a fungus. It, Do I guess corporate? <laughs> <laughs> it is a fungus, but it's actually considered the fruit of the fungus. So mushrooms aren't a fruit, but they are considered the fruiting body of the fungus. We've done some fun, kind of more interactive workshops and pairing events like at Blue Nose Gopher Public House. So that's been fun. But yeah, I'm full up on workshops and speaking engagements about mushrooms, which I find kind of mind blowing. Good forager always shares their findings, but never discloses specifically where they find something. Because we're out in the woods, we're working hard for these spots. We're not just gonna give them up. Kind of like a fisherman, right? They never say, they'll just say on the lake, on the river. Because we want to keep being able to harvest things, we want to respect the land. And so there are different ways that I harvest plants. I don't take everything and I don't take the substrate behind it. What this is fruiting from is that whole mycelial network. That's what we can't see, but it is there. So I don't want to disturb that because I want this to keep coming back. Harvest with a grateful heart and walk lightly. Seven years ago, when I picked up an ID book, I didn't realize that I was really starting any journey. When I started realizing how intricate and detailed and awesome nature is and how intelligent, I became hopelessly addicted. And seriously, every day in the past seven years, there's not many days that go by that I'm not out in the woods. It was a time, now looking back on these seven years, I really did go inward, and I think that just happened naturally. I emerged, I guess, seven years later out of the woods and I feel like I have a message to share, but also within myself, I feel this really great sense of peace. The woods have shown me a lot about myself. Postcards is made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. Additional support provided by Margaret A. Cargill Philanthropies. Mark and Margaret Yakel Juline on behalf of Shalom Hill Farms, a retreat and conference center in a prairie setting near Wyndham, Minnesota. On the web at shalomhillfarm.org.
Alexandria, Minnesota, a year-round destination with hundreds of lakes, trails, and attractions for memorable vacations and events. More information at explorealex.com. The Lake Region Arts Council's Arts Calendar, an arts and cultural heritage funded digital calendar showcasing upcoming art events and opportunities for artists in West Central Minnesota, on the web at lrac4calendar.org. Playing today's new music plus your favorite hits, 96.7 Cram, online at 96.7cram.com. 